Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, Johnny Midnight proudly brings to you the Midnight Express Podcast! Hey guys, welcome to episode 8 of the Midnight Express Podcast. Hope you guys had a fantastic Christmas and New Year. Mine was, uh, mine was awesome, to be honest. Took the kids to Lapland a few days before Christmas. Uh, coincidentally enough, only a week after previous podcast interviewee Dean Ormark took his kids there. Uh, and it was awesome, to be honest. Anyone that's thinking about taking their kids to see the real Santa in his house, I'd thoroughly recommend it. So, yeah, podcast six with Mad Mad Manson went down well. Got a, great, got a lot of great feedback from it. Uh, that's up to the third most listened to podcast already. Slightly behind Dean Ormark, second most listened to. Uh, but clear out in the front is Rampage Brown, podcast number one. I don't know if it's because it's been out longest or his exposure through British Boot Camp or what have you. But that is by far the most listened to podcast at the moment. And we're on around about a thousand, just shy of a thousand listens now. So pretty much you listening to this, whoever you are, will send us over a thousand. So to today's podcast, it's with a guy called Chris Curtis, who if you've only just got into British wrestling in the last couple of years, you probably won't have heard of. Uh, but Chris has been on the scene for 25 years, all in all, he was just telling me, uh, both as, as a wrestler himself and is mainly well known as the the, the trainer and the runner of the GBH school in Stoke, which produced a lot of the, the top wrestlers, really, in, in Britain of the last 10 years or so. I've already recorded the podcast with Chris. Uh, we're just going to go straight into it now, guys. Hope you enjoy it. For the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Okay, guys, so today's podcast interview is with a guy called Chris Curtis. Now, I mainly know Chris from uh, his experiences training a lot of the the guys who've become some of the bigger names in British wrestling over the last 10 years. Uh, but of course, Chris is a very experienced wrestler in his own right. So he's got a lot of stories to tell about both his experiences as a wrestler and as a trainer. And hopefully there's lots of good stuff going to come out of it. So firstly, Chris, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me on. I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. So Chris, take me right back to, to, to day one. I, I don't really know your, your backstory. So when did you first get into pro wrestling? Oh, crikey. I mean, it. Do you mean like from when did I start watching it or when did I decide like, you know... A bit, a bit of both, I suppose. Uh, it's something that kind of hit me in my teens. Mm-hmm. I was about 12, maybe 13, something like that. So I hadn't sort of been watching it from a really, really young age. It sort of came along in, in, in my sort of teenage years. Uh, and at the time I was doing... Uh, Doing quite a lot of jiu-jitsu, training three days a week in jiu-jitsu, uh, you know, throughout the teens, going through the bouts and things like that. And I just happened to catch a few episodes of wrestling on a, a Saturday afternoon mm-hmm. at the World Sports Stuff. Uh, and, you know, so, some of the guys on there, some of the workers, and it, it, from a martial arts perspective, even though what they were doing you could consider to be a work, I could see an art form in that, and I very much enjoyed it. You know, I sort of appreciated it as, as not sort of from a Marx or a punter's point of view, but like somebody coming from a martial arts background, seeing some of the holes and the switches and escapes. I sort of appreciated that, sure. and sort of the ability of the guys who did it. So uh, I kind of became a fan of, really, uh, a punter, if you will. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can point the finger and say I've been a punter. That's, that's no, nothing enough. wrong with being a punter, mate. To some degree, I'm still a punter now. I enjoy watching wrestling and occasionally on. spend money on it. So, yeah. uh, You know, I'll take that one on the chin because I think most people who get into this business, if we're all honest, we've all been punters at yeah. some point in our lives. So, uh, so if, if you don't mind me ageing you now, what, what sort of year was that then when you were 12? Uh, oh, God. It'd be, about 1982, so 44. That's good. Uh, so you got a good run there of, what, six or so years of, of watching it on World of Sport before it went off? Yeah, yeah. Which, had, which, which of the guys did you particularly like at the time? This is what I was talking to. I didn't actually care for all, all you know, every single wrestling match that I saw on the TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of my favourite ones throughout the teenage years, I could actually name some of the matches and, you know, while we, I mean... 
okay, I'm stuck in, I'm being nostalgic now, I'm stuck in my ways. You know what I'm saying? Uh, one of my favourite matches was Rollerball Rocco versus uh, Fuji Yamada. Mm-hmm. That was, a, I, that, I, that was, you know, it was a young, impressionable kid. I thought that was, you know, wow, you know, brilliant match. I've actually I've seen actually, that match on YouTube and it was a hell of a match, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I actually found a damn good one the other day. I think it's an unbroadcast one. And it's uh, Mark Rollerball Rocker versus Chet Cullen. Uh-huh. And what an amazing match. This is like 1985, 1986. And, okay, there was no lucha then or anything like that. But you put that match on and it's, it holds up even today, you know, over 20 years later, you know. So uh, I think that says something about the standard of, of some of the wrestling that was on. Definitely. That's yeah. one thing that surprised me a little bit. About about 10 years or so ago when I started getting into being a wrestler myself, I went back and studied a lot of the old British style. And because I was fairly young when it went off world of sport, my, my main memory really is Big Daddy and John Haystack. So that's kind of the way I remember British wrestling. But actually, going back and watching the likes of Rocco, you know, Young Dynamite Kid, uh, or some of those guys, and the fantastic technical stuff they could produce, which, as you said, holds up today, many years later, was was a, was a surprise, to be honest. It was like this is one name that you know a lot of fans will be familiar with: Owen Hart. Owen mm-hmm. uh, Hart versus Marty James. That was a televised match on World of Sport. Yeah, that was an awesome match. I mean, you know, if, if nobody's ever heard of Marty James, you need to go onto YouTube and type in. Marty Jones versus Owen Hart. Bear in mind, this thing sort of like the mid 1980s. Yeah. You know, it's considered outdated nowadays. But you watch it and you just see how over the match is. You know, it's really over match. Uh, so I, I like guys like Rocco, Marty. Uh, I did like Owen Hart when he wrestled over here. You know, uh, guys like the Dynamite Kid as well. You know, but. I, I think for me, as a teenager growing up, I was I was a big fan for Mark Rocco. Mm-hmm. You know, I just liked his style, the sort of no nonsense style that the guy had. Uh, at the same time, I liked some of the technical stuff, like stuff that was broadcast, like the Kid McCoy when he was wrestling, like to say Stephen Curry, or some of Johnny Saints' work as well. You know, uh, you know, fantastic, fantastic technical wrestlers. You know, you can't. Can't really knock these guys, you know, for their ability and what they do. Of course, yeah. That's just reminding me there. Um, Kid McCoy was, of course, King Ben's son. And yeah. uh, some of the stories I've heard over the years from some of the, uh, the older wrestlers who, who perhaps don't wrestle anymore about King Ben are, are phenomenal. I remember Drew McDonald telling me they went to, I think it was Nigeria, and King Ben slept with 57 local women in a week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then apparently came home and, and gave, gave his wife a dose of the clap, apparently. <laughs> I would imagine if you tried to do that nowadays, you'd be bringing back more than a dose of the quack, mate. Yeah, true. It's yeah. probably not advisable in this day and age. Yeah, definitely. So at some point then, you obviously decided that you wanted to give this a go yourself. And of course, back then, it was very much closed shop. There was no wrestling schools at all. How did you go about not, breaking no. in? No, absolutely not. I mean, the only way you could... It was, this was the thing. There was no schools whatsoever. And the only way really to become a wrestler is to really either know one or ask one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, a bit like the Freemasons in a way, mm. you know, because it had its very tight kayfabe and things like that. So uh, I actually plucked the courage up when I was about 19 years of age at a local show at Hanley and went and had a word with Max Crabtree. Mm-hmm. And, I basically told him that, like, over the past few years, I've been doing, like, martial arts training. Uh, a year before that, I actually began working out on weights and things, even though I still looked puny at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was working out on weights. I was amateur boxing three nights a week as well to sort of give me the cardio. Uh, and he said, okay, fine, like, you know, I'll, I'll introduce you to some of the boys. And this amazed me because he just took me straight into the dressing room. Mm. I was quite shocked at, you know, because there's always been this cloak and dagger uh, around the business. So he took me backstage and I spoke to two local wrestlers, uh, John Wilkie and Keith Myatt. Yeah. Uh, basically, I think I exchanged phone numbers with Keith. And I can't remember if I called Keith or Keith called me. Probably I called Keith because I was that eager, you know. Of course. Uh, and he was basically like, well, at the moment, I'm 
wasn't available to train anybody. So he gave me Mike Williams' number. So I called Mike, and Mike was already training one young guy. Uh, and this was sort of inside a, a small sports hall, inside a, a school sports hall. Uh, so there was just like mats down, just you sort of found judo mats. Yeah. So there was no ring, nothing like that. So uh, Mike was already training a lad, and he said, yeah, okay, come off, right, give it a go, and take it from there, just just see if it's your cup of tea. So it was basically a load of calisthenics, like bodyweight calisthenics, to blow you up. And then Mike was like, okay, you taught me things like how to link up, things like that. But as you linked up with Mike, the thing you didn't realise was, Mike had done a lot of sort of freestyle wrestling, uh like sort of, you know, the Olympic style. Mm-hmm. And also done some, uh, quite a bit of judo with the, the wrestler grasshopper in Nottingham. So my part to shoot, you know. And I think in, that, in a way that was a test that I'd see if he'd come back next week or the week after that or the week after that. You know, so this would go on for several weeks. But it's sort of a way of, it's an old school thing that they sort of like test an individual and see if they'll keep coming back, yeah. you know. Yeah. They want it badly enough. So it was like it was like that for quite a long time. And then Mike actually started to teach me, you know, wrestling holes and things like that. Obviously I was at a bit of a disadvantage because we hadn't got a ring then. You yeah. know, so I, I didn't have a clue how the first match I had, I didn't have a clue how to run the race or <laughs> how to take a corner properly. You know, uh so I in that way of working, I was a shambles. So what was your first match then? Um, first match was at Vicky All Hanley. Uh, mm-hmm. with, uh, I was against one man John Wilkie. Yeah. He was a local wrestler. And uh, Keith Myers. Uh, and the tag partner was a guy who worked under the name of Kid Socks. He was right. a local worker as well. It was terrible. <laughs> it was pathetic. You know, it was... You know, I, I was as green as grass. I was rotten. I still think I'm rotten. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was as green as grass. And I think, you know, that's just the way it was, you know. And of course, it, yeah. You, 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 you can look back now on your matches from years ago and, and see how green you were. You know, like, say, if I dug out an old VH ta- VHS tape of 20 years ago, I'd look at it cringe, you yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> it was that green. Uh so I think that, that that was just the way it was. You know, you, you had your things and your scare things because that was kind of a, an initiation process, so to speak, back then. So I went through all that. But, yeah, I started out with the Crabtrees, with Matt Crabtree uh, at first. And, you know, he gave me a lightly break in the business. Uh, you know, a lot of the shows I went to, I'd travel with Mark Weaver. Yeah. You know, it's like it's the purse strings, isn't it? It's the pets were money and things like that, so it makes more sense to get two, three, or four guys in a car. Yeah, of course. To book one guy in a car, you know. So uh, it was the promoters with the purse strings, really. But uh, you know, that, that's the way it is. Business is business. So it's, uh, yeah, that was a good education. <laughs> it was a baptism of fire, and it was a damn good education at the same time. Cool. So over the next few years, then presumably you carried on working for Max Crabtree, and that was towards the end of the time that Max was running, wasn't it? Did he finish in? Was it around yeah, the mid nineties? I I came in when I was twenty one, because uh, I've been training since I was nineteen. But that became a fortnightly thing because Mike used to work in the pottery industry and used to work shifts, so we could only talk once a fortnight. And during school holidays, like the big five or six weeks holidays, the place would be closed. Yeah. So training just came to a halt and then kept back in again. So, you know, that's all that was available at the time. Uh, you know, I, I can't knock it. I'm grateful to Mike, you know, for what he's taught me and what he's done for me you know, and everything that, that the guy's done throughout me over the years. So, you know, I'm certainly not complaining about that. Uh, well, yeah, I worked for Max for a couple of years, and then he just seemed to, like, shut up shop. Uh, because I think what it was at the time, sort of like the, late, the very late 80s and the very early 90s, was that the British wrestling had now been axed from TV. Uh, and everybody, you know, it was 
cheapest chaps to go out and buy a satellite dish there. And you're getting the WWF as it was then. Uh, so I think that did the business sort of no favours. Mm -hmm. It sort of removed from everybody's consciousness the big draws that we used to watch, like Kenny Nagasaki or Marty Jones or Rollerball Rocco. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's Paul Hogan and Randy Savage in the case. You know, so uh, I think in a way, if you didn't have the business over here, you know what I mean? Yeah, of being replaced with something else. Uh, but, you know, that seemed to affect business. But when Matt shut up shop, Mike, I think, had an offer from Brian Dixon to go and do a few shows for Brian. So Mike says, you know, do you want to invite? Would you like to do a few? And I said, yeah, you know, I'll go give it a go. Uh, and, you know, that was great, you know, working for Brian. You know, but I mean, this was just, when I was working for Brian, it was more of a part time thing with Max. Back in the day, it, it could be five, six days a week, you know, all up and down the country, uh, you know, and wrestling different people. Uh, that's kind of like, you know, that's all part of the learning process, if you know what I mean. Yeah, of course. Yeah, miles in and that. So uh, I did that with Max. Then, like I said, I started doing a few for Brian just on a part time basis. And I, I think. Both, both guys were suffering a little bit at the time, business-wise. I don't think Max was doing too well, and I don't think Brian Dixon was doing too well. I think it was the whole WWE thing and us being axed. Mm -hmm. but, you know, Brian kept at it. Max decided to call it a day, and Brian kept at it. And, you know, I mean, you look at Brian now. He, there's so many promotions out there. I, I don't know how many promotions he has in this country. He's probably a hundred. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I reckon a hundred's not a bad shout. Uh, but it's like Brian's still the number one guy, you know. So he's obviously, I've heard people knock his product, but he's been in this business over 40 years. He's done something right. Exactly. You know, that's common sense. He's, he's done something right. And ultimately, the people who knock his product aren't the people who Brian's aiming his product at. It, those people aren't ever going to enjoy the sort of thing he puts out there. So why should he try and tweak what he does to, to please them. He's got that family audience that, that works well, that comes to the shows, that buy the foam fingers, that, that pay the boys' wages, and yeah. that works for him. Brian's a businessman, mm. you know what I mean? It's a lot of people who start up promotions. They may go and max out a credit card. I don't know. I don't know how people talk about it these days. But, you know, you, you say, oh, we're going to have the best this or we're going to have the best that, and within two or three years, bang, end of story you know but Brian keeps going he's consistent I mentioned uh, on one of the previous podcasts I think the, the, the problem that most people who get into promoting have is they don't actually want to be a promoter they want to be a, a booker they want to organise shows put their favourite wrestlers on there and what have you but the actual promoting of the show letting people know about it isn't really something they, they often bother with whereas Brian's kind of the opposite he'll promote the show he'll get people there and then it's almost a little bit of an afterthought as to what the actual show is going to be and what it's going to deliver but that's the way to, to, to make money, I suppose. Well, I'll give you an example. I'll fast forward in my case. Uh, I was offered some work to do for a guy uh, up Lincolnshire called Jerry Norton. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jerry had his own promotion, but he was looking at doing some shows in different areas. And at the time, Victoria Hall was closed. I think it was going under some big refurbishment. So nobody's running the territory. You know, Brian's not there, Max Crabtree's not there, nobody's running the territory. So I actually found a place. It wasn't ideal. It was Jolly's, a nightclub called Jolly's in Longton. Mm -hmm. And Jerry said, yeah, we'll, we'll put the show on there. So Jerry asked me to book the show. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll book the show. That's booking. It's like when you call the guys up on the phone or text or email or whatever. You see two guys who you think will work well together and complement each other. That's booking. I was booking for Jerry. I wasn't actually taking any financial risk. When you take the financial risk, you're the promoter. You know, it's, there's more to promoting than just booking. You've got to go out there and put posters up all around town. Uh, you know, that's a big thing that Brian does to this day. That's a very old school method, but Brian plasters how many red posters uh he'll run his ads in the local paper and we're talking expensive ads you know 
he understands you've got to spend money to make money. Yeah. You know, he's a businessman. He knows how to draw the crowd. I've done these shows in the past that have been quite hardcore because it seemed to be the current trend, you know. And that, that was a big mistake that I made in the past, was going down the hardcore route a bit too much. Where, And you wonder why these things fade out. Well, Brian keeps to a family audience. A hardcore show might draw a few teenagers and you know a few you know beer swellers or whatever but if you want to make money you want to draw more people in that's common sense so we aim to the moms the dads and the kids you know so i can't knock him he's, he's a businessman he's survived in the business this long he's been very successful i can't knock the guy you know i really can't he's done something nice and also that family audience will always be there the the sort of 18 to 25 male demographic, what they like changes over time. You've had the attitude era, you've had like more technical stuff throughout the, the, the noughties and whatever, what they want changes. But I think six to eight to 10 year old kids are always going to like the product Brian puts out there. So really, why would he change it? This is it because I, I know some, I don't know if this will make sense to people out there, but I know potters whose grandmothers, mothers, you know, sons, grandkids have grown up going to that one venue at Becky Hall in Hammond. Mm-hmm. Now, one, because it is, you know, seen as the premier wrestling venue in Stoke on Trent, you know, it's synonymous with wrestling. Uh, and one is the, the fans go back to the days of, even before Brian Twat and Dale Martin promotions would be there, you know, so. We're talking something where families, it's the grandkids, the kids, you know, all the family there for generations. They're not with it. You know, I mean, this makes me feel old. Uh, he's a punter like, and I know here are kids and the grandkids and the great grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel really old. <laughs> of course, yeah. Uh, but I think they just pop a sprog out as soon as they leave school now. So. Well, that, that does help, doesn't it? Yeah. Another great example of being a good promoter as well is a guy called Ian McGregor. Now, if there's wrestlers... Ian was that... a genius. Ian was an absolute genius. And I'll tell you a quick story about Ian. I was doing a, a show once for Jerry Norton in, in Stoke on Trent. And the idea was we had a battle royal or a royal rumble at the end. And I was the baby face laughing uh, against two heels. I think it was Keith Might and Ian McGregor. And the plan was, you know, baby face goes over send all the punters home happy and ian is a genius he came up with this idea he said no i'll tell you what chris he says you'll be left with me and me and keith and we did some sort of angle where i eliminate uh mcgregor but mcgregor distracts the referee then i eliminate keith the ref don't see but keith comes in cheap shots me from behind and you know that kind of a finish Mm -hmm. and ian's idea and i'm not kidding you the punters were all up on the edge of the ringside going absolutely mad at Keith Myatt like, you know. And we worked this angle for sort of like a return grudge match. You know, that sort of G up as we call it. You know, I know they're called angles nowadays, mm-hmm. but back then we'd call them a G up. And we did this G up and it drew them back in again. You know, I mean he again he's genius, he and us. A great example of uh, Ian being good at promoting is, uh, I think it was about March, maybe April 2008, I did a show for him at the Manchester Velodrome. And a few weeks later, I read on the internet, on one of the fan forums, I was just looking at some of the stuff on there, and they were debating what was the biggest British show over the last 20 years. So some of the guys were saying um, one of Alex Shane's super super shows drew, I think, about 3,000. I think there's a few others that were like one to two. And I was like, I I worked for 3,500 people for Ian the other weekend. Yeah. But no one even noticed, unless you lived in the immediate vicinity of Manchester Velodrome, where he promoted the hell out of it, no one else in the rest of the country knew it. And again, for his point of view, he didn't care. People who lived 100 miles away who weren't going to come, why would he make an effort to let them know about it when he can spend that time getting people who live on the, the, the street and half a mile down the road? I mean, I remember him co-promoting a show in, the early, in my early days. He co-promoted one in Max Crabtree. And it was in Altringham, Manchester. Uh... Three three thousand pounds. Yeah. You know, he just I don't know what Ian did to draw. Just, I believe he's very big on doing his posters. His posters, mate. His posters. My my last match when I uh, stopped wrestling or retired, as some people are calling it, about three months ago in my new hometown of Macclesfield. 
uh, about three weeks before, just boom, all of a sudden the entire yeah. town was covered in posters. <laughs> yeah, but this is, a, this is a guy who gets off his arse and he'll go out there, knock on shop windows, excuse me, blah, 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 can I put a poster? Or, you know, sometimes I've done it, I've, you know, I know it's illegal, but you go out with a staple gun and bang a few up somewhere, you know. Uh, but people now seem to rely on the internet yeah. more, more than anything. And it's like the posters are such a big thing that's overlooked. You've really got to batter a place, plaster a place to really draw. Uh, we're talking, you know, get off your arse and do the graft, you know. Uh, some of these new bookers or promoters that there are now just want to post it on Facebook so it's important to the friends, you know. Of course. I mean, don't get me wrong, I know people who've got businesses who do all these tagging people in the Facebook and they market it on Facebook and they're so successful, you know. Uh, even workers, you know, they get so many bookings because they promote themselves on on Facebook. And if that's the way forward, so be it. But yeah, still go out there and do it. It has its place. It's like, same as anything, the more fishing rods you put out there, the more different ways you've got of attracting potential business. So like, for example, my, my business that I've got, a lot of our business comes from Facebook. But then if I just left it to that, it wouldn't be enough. So yeah. we have other systems in place to... But like I said, lots of different fishing rods. The more different ways you've got of attracting people, the more likely you to pull them in. To be honest, I think the internet's been... I mean, you know, I thought it was a very negative thing because I used to look on the UK fan forum and I just don't go on there anymore. I don't know what it's like now, but any state is just negative, negative, negative. And these people who post on there, and even some people who write magazines, they've never been in a wrestling ring and been what I would call initiated... So to me, their opinion means nothing, you know. Uh, I'd, you listen to your peers, you know, you don't listen to some arsehole on a fan forum. I'd fall into this trap of getting into arguments with people on fan forums because I think you're talking shit or whatever. And I just don't do it anymore. It's a waste of your time. Why do that? Them I was just spending arguing with, with that, with that knobhead who's never done a day's wrestling in his life, and you don't have to justify yourself to. In that time, you could have just banged a load of posters out. Of course, of course. Cool. So taking a step back there, a minute ago you mentioned Kendo Nagasaki, and in the uh, the conversation we had before we started recording this, you mentioned you got a good story about him. Oh man, the heat back in the day. Uh, it was like I remember doing this show. I, I'd not been wrestling very long. Uh, and it was at Cleethorpe's just outside of Grimsby and I was wrestling Mike Weaver because my me, me, me first few bouts were Mike or Keith you know quite a lot of them were and then you eventually got to work with other people and I think that's how you learn you know it's like that's experience if it makes any sense mm-hmm. uh, so it's like uh, I did those with Mike and Keith I was doing one at Cleethorpe's and I wrestled Mike. Brian Crabtree was refereeing and getting very involved in the matches. And I think the, the top of the bill, the main event, was Pat Roach and I think Johnny A. No. Pat Roach and Johnny Angel against Kendo and Wendy Barrett. Mm-hmm. And uh, this one particular night, I think that they finished Kendo was doing the sword in Johnny Angel's eyes and some kind of a moody finish like that. So anyway, like, the crowd went mad. They went absolutely berserk. The next thing you know, all the workers are busting in through the dressing room and they're pushing the door shut because the punters have gone that mad. There was so much heat that they were trying to break into the dressing room. <laughs> and in this old venue, uh, I think it was called a memorial hall, there was actually, like, the old axes on the wall behind glass, like, breaking... You know, the hose pipes, the old firefighting stuff. And I think somebody had broke the glass and actually thrown this axe at Kendo. And he just got through the door and it had sort of embedded itself into the door. Jeez. Uh, that was a bit of a scary night. Yeah, you know. And, and, and your main concern back then wasn't, oh, God, if the punters come in here so enraged, we're all... You know, we've got a fight on around. It was like, oh, Christ, we can't have them come in any here. Like, it's breaking kayfabe. Of course. <laughs> it's got a certain irony to it, you know. 
it's a, you don't really get that sort of heat anymore. And the, the one time I got close to that, I, I had my first match in 2003, by which point kayfabe had been essentially dead for a number of years. But I did a match in, uh, it was near Lincoln for, I think it was Jerry Norton actually, against a guy yeah. called Mark Mignot, who, who I wrestled when I first started wrestling in Sheffield, who did a, a French gimmick. And they absolutely hated him to the point where there were literally people were reaching in from the outside of the ring, trying to hit him. People had stuff in their hands. And we were keeping the match in the middle of the ring, almost surprised, thinking, shit, I didn't realise this sort of stuff still happened. But back in the day, I should imagine that was a regular occurrence. I remember one night, uh, I think it was Keith Mike, it was, I think Mike Weaver at Clay Corps, uh, And you, if you speak to him, they'll tell you this story. It's quite amusing. You know, like how blind people have the, the Labrador guide dogs? Mm-hmm. Some gentleman had taken his blind guy and gone in and listened to the show to his guide dog gun. And Keith had got thrown over the top rope and the dog bit Keith on his ass. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> okay, it wasn't funny for Keith, but it's, I think what it was just felt threatened, you know, for its yeah. owner and just protected. But you no, know, I find that quite amusing. <laughs> You know, just things like that on the road. You know, you, yeah, you, of course, yeah. you do laugh at other people's misfortunes sometimes. Cool. So yeah. at some point then in the, the latest 90s, then you obviously decided to set up your wrestling school in Stoke, didn't you? Yeah, because I was I was by now literally sort of doing everything for Jerry. The postering, the, the whole marketing of the show. You know, I got a few contacts in the local paper to work with. So I'm trying to sort of reach out there wherever I could, you know, not just the posters, I'd try and get on local radio and whatever you can to promote them. So uh, I decided to open this wrestling school because I'd actually come in contact with two guys who'd, um, who'd come through Hammerlock. Uh, that was Paul Paul Volt or Paul Beswick, mm-hmm. a chap called Matt Baker. And, you know, they're saying to me, oh, yeah, like, you know, the Yes, I'm like wrestling school, like, you know, it's weird. Of course, like, bing, light bulbs on, I've seen pound signs. <laughs> and I thought, no, yeah, why not Why not have a go at it, you know? So uh, I opened the wrestling school, and I think some of the first students that come along are like uh, Dino, Dino Mark, Robbie Dynamite, uh, there was Kit Cool, uh, Mikey Weplash, mm-hmm. uh, Stevie Strong, I think he works as now, is he? Uh, I don't think he still works anymore, but yeah, and I know Steve from back in the day. Yeah, there's a few others like Iceman and Iceman's brother, and a few other guys. Uh, and I think the first one we did, Keith came along to help out, like, you know, and uh, we put the boys, what we basically did, we went to that power plant on the year, you know, we, we sort of basically done with exercises, and then we'd teach them how to bump, and we'd bump Joe them and bump Joe them and bump Joe them, and, you know, then we'd have them doing like back to back, like the judo and they were, so yeah, sort of doing yeah. submission wrestling. And Dynamite, what Dean said is absolutely true. Dynamite tapped out everybody he got on the mat with. You know, the Robbie Dynamite. I can and imagine. That kid knew more than he was letting on when he, when he came and trained with me because he'd already done amateur. He'd done amateur for a number of years by that point, hadn't he? He already, his terminology of like Japanese judo techniques and things like that, you know. He was quite well informed. He, he he was quite clued up and knew what was what, you know. But those those guys were really dedicated, you know, really hard working, dedicated individuals. And when some of them did go and work for Brian, I mean, am I allowed to swear on it? Yeah, feel free. <laughs> uh, I was really pissed off. Not not because I saw it as a betrayal. Nothing like that. At the end of the day, I can't blame them for working for Brian. If he's offering them five shows a week, loads of experience working with other guys, loads of opportunities, paydays, you know, etc. I can't blame them for going. It's what I got in the business for. Mm-hmm. I was pissed off because I was losing a bunch of very talented individuals, you know. Uh, but I've got no, I've got no axe to grind with Brian. I've got no axe to grind with any of the boys. You know, it's like business is business. I'm glad they went and worked for Brian because look at the exposure they've had and the experience and how much more they are now as wrestlers. You know, it's like, no, they did the right thing. You know, absolutely. 
I was saying to Dino, actually, in that podcast, it'd be interesting, I don't know if you've got a copy, uh, you mentioned of one of the, I think it was the first show you did, one of the Rumbles, so there was obviously him, there was Whippy, uh, Nathan Kidcool, Robbie Dynamite was in there, yeah, Steve Strong, a uh, couple of the other guys, um, I think it was Five Star Flash then, or did it come a little bit later? It came in a little bit later than the other boys, Mark yeah. came from Day Star, and Mark was very talented, you know, he was a really talented individual, but he just had this ability to rub people the wrong way. Okay, uh, here's an example. This is a story I heard. You know what? When the boys stay at Brian's digs, yeah. Brody steals over on to it and he's going around to the boys. Do you want to go to the gym? Do you want to go to the gym? Sort of rallying the troops around. And he comes to five star. <laughs> Do you want to go to the gym? No, can't be asked. Why? <laughs> I don't need to. I've got a degree. Yeah, that's not the thing you say. Even if you think school. it, it's not advisable, is it? <laughs> not the sort of thing you say to an old school mate like Brody to steal. You just, you just don't say yeah. it in the first place. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I've, I, I know Mark had, had this tendency to come across as he could be quite arrogant at times, and that did sort of rub people the wrong way. Yeah, um, I know what you mean. Uh, pretty much the same as I mentioned about Domino, and not that I'm comparing these two guys, but in a similar way. I, I got on with Five Star, but to be honest, I. I kind of get on with anyone. I don't. No, no, I get on with them. My life, I've not liked, but I can see how he did wind some people up the wrong way. Yeah. Funnily yeah. enough, actually, speaking of Five Star Flash, um, in the Rampage Brown podcast, we were mentioning the uh, the car journey from uh, Minehead to Skegness, where um, I punched him in the kidneys and he pissed himself, and then we smacked some eggs on his head. And ah. Five Star Flash actually messaged me. He was the fifth man in the car. I couldn't quite remember who it was. So just, oh. just to tie that story in, he was he was the fifth man in the car. And I thought he was the one that videoed the egging, but he reckons not. <laughs> Some of the reps the boys get up to. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Things have changed now. I wouldn't dare punch around face bar in the kidneys now. It'd, it'd fucking kill me. <laughs> punch you in the kidneys? No, I punched him. He was. Uh, we, we owed him... We were playing this game where basically you, you got hit when you got something wrong, and you got it wrong quite a lot. Ah, so I was the, driving. Game, the name game, yeah? That's it, yeah. Because I was driving, I, um, I couldn't... Game. Have... From our, on the buses back in the day, isn't it? When you used to travel and you'd have the name game and you'd go through the alphabet. It was a slightly it, different one to that, but, the, but, but same sort of concept. And basically, I owed him like 50 punches and we pulled up to the services. He, he, I wasn't going to do anything, but he, he got out and sort of did a big stretch, essentially giving me the office, showing me his back. So I, I popped him in the kidneys and Paul had pissed himself. <laughs> <laughs> he, he wasn't quite as big and mean looking as he is now, though. That's the, uh, the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was only about 21 then, bless him. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, obviously the school, you see, you got started training those guys and you started running shows. Um, how long did the, the, the first run of the school go on? Uh, whew. Well, when I started, like I said, I started out with, with the boys of just mad, like Dino and Robbie and, uh, I mean, like Weppy, back in the day. It's what I said earlier about, watching your matches when you first start out. When I first saw Effie do the first few sessions, I thought, this guy isn't, no, 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 it's not going to happen for this guy. And if there's one individual who's ever proved me wrong, it's Weppy. You know, it's like, I can't, you know, I take my hat off to him. He's one of the best, if not the best heel in the country. You know, you've got to say you're one of the top heels out there. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I love to see Weppy work now. He's come such a long way. Uh, those boys sort of went to it for Brian, which as soon as they started working for Brian, you know, there's going to come this situation where Brian's going to say, uh, well, you know, you can't go at the catches, but uh, I'm going to give four dates a week. What are they going to do? Mm -hmm. They know which side Brad's put it on. They're going to work for Brian. So, you know, it was a foregone conclusion. Sooner or later, the boys would go. So I was pissed off that I was losing the talent. Yeah. But I don't blame Brian. You know, Brian's got to get talent from somewhere. Uh, and, you know, I don't blame the boys either. You know, they've, they've gone. They've gone and got a payday. They've gone and got a shitload of experience. They've been successful. You know, they really have. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen these adverts in these wrestling magazines of like James Ty as the number one UK rookie of the year out of the whole country. Well, where have these guys been looking? He was, he was talent up here in Stoke, seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, perhaps that's something I should leave off. We're going a bit Iron Sheik now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go in Iron Sheik mode. But what, what I'm saying is, the bi- magazines can be biased. You know, I, like Power Slam and things like that. It's They seem to have a favourite commission and they get the publicity as said they're the only thing that exists. When there is talent elsewhere, if, if they get off bar some week for it, you know, there's talent all over the place. Just as you may remind me that one of the only times I ever read about uh, All Star Wrestling and Power Slam when I was uh, before I started wrestling was they had a, like a results column, and yeah. uh, it was generally the American shows they put you know WWF or E or whatever it was at that point, uh, Meadowlands Arena, ten thousand people and all the details, and they put an All Star show, which I think it was in maybe Dorking or something like that, and I actually looked back at it a few years ago and it had Nathan, it had Kid Cool, it had Dean etc yeah. on it. And it put the attendance as a hundred, which it, it probably was. But yeah. I remember reading it at the time, thinking, "Well, that sounds a bit shit." And I could only think that they chose to put it in, that being the only mention of All Star I remember in that magazine, because it made it sound shit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't like the All Star product because it's family oriented. Pardon me. It's very, very cheesy. You know, it's very sort of cheapy and very cheesy. But, you know, that gets over. That draws money. That's why the guy's been promoting it for 20 years, you know. And, you know, he he knows what he's doing. You know, he's got a formula. Brian's got a formula. And he sticks to it, you know. And he's been at it now for so long. You know, he knows what. So how long did Sorry the... about the impersonation, Brian. I know it's a terrible impersonation. I, I, I don't even bother because uh, I'm not very good at impersonations anyway and there's so many guys out there that can do spot-on impressions that I know mine's not <laughs> really as good as theirs, so I'm not even going to try. I've heard stories about guys booking venues and, you know, convincing workers that they've been booked by Brian and that person on the other end of the phone hasn't been Brian. But I can't tell you who that person is. I, th- I think me and you know who it is, but we can't sort of broadcast this information, can we? Well, I, 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 can, t- I can tell of one. I know, I know Robbie Brookside's done that because he used to freely talk about it. He used to tell Brian that he used to do it. He, uh, yeah. yeah, he'd ring boys up and leave them off the job. They'd get a call that night from Brian saying, where are you? He's like, but you rang me this morning, Brian said I was off. <laughs> you should get a podcast with Robbie just to get a I, I tried, I've tried. I, uh, I messaged Frankie Sloan. Um, uh, about getting a, a contact with Robbie because uh, I, I knew Robbie pretty well when we when I wrestled regularly for All Star, but it's been a long time since I had any contact with him. Uh, so hopefully something might come of that. Yeah, yeah, That'd be awesome if it did. So uh, yeah, we were talking about the school there. So how long did your school run for? Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> Seriously, uh, was it ninety nine? Starts is that right? I I decided to wrap it all up not last year, the year before. Mm-hmm. And basically because uh, people would complain that they didn't like bumping on judo mats and, you know, things like this, or they're not coming to training because they've got a sniffle. And it, we're talking a completely different mentality to the boys that I started out with. Okay. Uh, because I mean, like, after some of the boys went, left and went to it for All-Stars, some other talented guys come along. It was like Johnny Fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could see... He, he, you know, he was a good enough wrestler to get regular bookings. Uh, he was bubblegum. Of course. Uh, yeah. And it's like, this, this guy, bubblegum like this, I notice now on Facebook, this kid's really getting out and about and getting a lot of bookings, you know. He seems really over, you know. I think as yeah. I mentioned in the podcast, uh, the last one, Madman Manson, bubblegum. I mean, he was always a fantastic worker back when I wrestled regularly and the few times I was on the same show as him. But at that point, he he looked like a young lad, whereas yeah. now he's got a hell of a physique on him and oh, he's developed yeah. himself a great character as well. So he's, he's, he's a great all-rounder now. Yeah, he's in great shape now, you know. And he, he just seems so over, you know, wherever he goes. So, And I, I'm just pleased to see guys doing that, you know, to go out and do well now, you know. So I'm chuffed. I really am. But the, the later intake weren't quite the same as those guys then? No, no. I mean, I'll give you that sample. I won't name a name, but I had a trainee call around my house and tell me he'd, he'd appeared on a few shows and he was quite a punter. You know? And he says, uh, Chris, you know, I, I reckon you'd draw more if you went to spend three grand on ring lighting. 
and it's basically resulted in me sort of laughing in his face. And he's like, "What? What's that response for?" And I'm like, "Pal, if I've got three grand of just disposable income here, I'm not going to spend it on life. I'm going to spend it on talent." Mm-hmm. Because, and I had to spell this concept out to him. That this is how people seem to be thick nowadays. I had to spell this concept out to him so I, I could have the best lighting that is like you know have all these rigs up and god knows what going on but if the rest seem talent is shit the show is shit exactly and it just didn't grasp that concept so and people might go to one show and like that but they're not going to come back if it, no matter it's how good everything else is yeah and it's at that point where you take the spectacles off your face and you start headbutting the brick wall because you just feel as though you get more sense out of the brick wall so I just had this feeling that it's not fair for me to say that the last bunch, that all of them weren't motivated. There were a few individuals that were, but there was just, I don't know, there was just so many individuals who were like, an excuse not to come to training this week, mm-hmm. an excuse not to come. And, and sometimes, you know, they can't even be asked to call or text you, you know. And it's like, one thing I tried to put into place in, in the last like few years that I was doing the school was, if you tell me this week you're coming to training next week, as far as I'm concerned, you're coming to training next week. If you can't come, if it's give me a text throughout the week, that's acceptable, or Facebook me or email me. If it's anything like within forty eight hours, you pick up the phone and you call me and you tell me you're not coming. Hmm. And I did this for a reason because it's like if you're gonna go out there and work for bookers or promoters, if you don't if you can't even be asked tell your coach you're not coming to the show. You're not going to have that respect for the booker or the promoter either. You know, and that leaves a booker or a promoter in the shit. You know, that's a bad thing to do. So that was just kind of one of the things I was trying to just instill, just common sense like, you know, like if you can't come in, we could you do that with a promoter or a booker? You know, so we could get some other talent in. So that's actually one I've noticed as well in my uh, in my career outside of wrestling. Uh, I sound like an old man myself now, I'm, I'm only 34, but at various points I've dealt with you know, a lot of younger guys applying for jobs with us and what have you in the early 20s, and sometimes they can't make an interview or they can't do what have you, and they just won't turn up. And then when I ring up afterwards, they're like, oh, I was, I was a bit too busy. Too busy to send a text. A text yeah. takes literally 10 seconds. Yeah. That, that mindset to me is, I don't know if that's an age thing or it's an upbringing thing, but I wouldn't dream of letting someone down, even if I didn't really like them or respect them or want to work with them. I'd still have the courtesy to send them a text or something like that. Exactly, but the thing is, okay, there's some individuals out there who might be as soft as shit and might let you get away with it, but I can't imagine Brian allowing somebody to show him that level of disrespect and then he'd pick up the phone and offer them more work. No. Not when he's got so many guys knocking at his door. (laughs) Have you got any work for me, Brian? You know, so, you know, what... Is there any sort of inexperienced kids listening to it? Just, just do that, you know. Keep in touch with your booker and your promoter, and you know. Sometimes you need to get in contact with people because it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. If somebody's running regular shows like Brian, if you're working for them on a part-time basis, pick up the phone now and again. You know, if you need me, you know what I mean. Jog the guy's memory. That's kind of things that I would do, you know. And, and what are the a lot of other workers would do, you know, years ago. You know, they give the promoter a bow now and again if they haven't heard anything in a while. I think really the, the clue is in the name. It's a professional wrestler. Like, most of the guys get the idea of being a wrestler, but they miss out the professional bit about, you know, dealing with people on a professional level. You know, the whole shaking your hands, introducing yourself thing. I mentioned before in the Rampage Brown podcast, that's no different to any job I've ever had. Whenever yeah. I meet someone for the first time, I'll shake their hand and say hello. Yeah, it's nothing exclusive to wrestling. I'll be polite. I'll be courteous, and even if I don't necessarily like them, I won't be an unprofessional dickhead in front of them. I'll let people know if I can't make something. It's it's being professional that yeah. it seems to miss some people that one. Yeah, I mean I've been in locker rooms with one or two people where I've wanted to punch you in the face. You know, but you're just professional. You know, hmm. <laughs> not many, just one or two individuals. You know, but. Uh... So the, uh, the school's closed down then, Chris. Are you still running the, the promotion, though? You're still promoting shows in Stoke, are you? I'm not promoting shows at the moment, no. Uh, and I'm not running the school either. But to my amazement, and I don't know how this has happened, but sort of since Christmas, I've had a load of sort of inbox messages. Are you running your school? You know, so 
I am actually, I'm in sort of 50-50 mind frame right now. You know, it's like, do I open the school? Do I open the school? You know. Uh, but I want to start with a completely new, if I do, I want to start with a completely new clean slate to say to people, look, this is the way the business works. You know, and it's kind of things we've been discussing throughout the night about, you know, sort of keeping your head down, speak when you're spoken to. Don't be an arrogant twat. You know, that's not going to do you any favours. Uh I want to sort of weed those individuals out and, yeah. and have people who are sort of, you know, really dedicated individuals because those are the people who are going to succeed at the end of the day. Of course, of course. Anything else you want to add to the interview? Any other stories from your time as a, as a wrestler and trainer? Uh, the only thing is now is sort of like at the moment, uh, I'm, sort of, I'm inactive, you know, for the, I am going to be getting a bit of Go to some of the old rest reunions that you see around, like, like the northern one. Uh, that's one that I go to, you know. And, you know, that's just for the workers, or, you know, either retired workers or so. If fans go, don't go if you're a fan, you know. It's, it's just for wrestlers and wrestlers only. But that's one thing I'm going to pop along to soon the, the northern wrestlers reunion. Mm-hmm. Uh, I might actually go a couple of nips up to Hanley and sort of just see, you know. I like to be nosy. I like to, to see what's going on. But I've, I've had my break from the business now. You know, at, at the time, I felt like I really needed a break because it was frustrating, sort of banging my head against a brick wall and, you know, really trying hard with a, a lot of individuals who couldn't be asked. So you can imagine how disheartening that is to somebody. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I definitely needed a break away from that. Uh, but like I say, I've had my break. Gonna have a good think about it now. See about whether I do open up or not again. Uh, but like I say, I, I only want to work with serious people now. You know, I don't want to work with you know people who are just in it for looking good in front of the mates or because they're on an ego trip. I'm just not in, interested in that kind of individual at all, to be honest. Cool. Good stuff. I think we've covered everything there, Chris. Any any last thoughts from you? I don't think so, no. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for your time, Chris. I appreciate I've it. A, I've, I've just had a great few years on the game. You know, I've, I'm, I'm enjoying retirement now. I do contemplate comebacks, you know, mm-hmm. but the one thing I would have to do is like a good, solid... I mean, I'm working out now. I haven't stopped working out, but I'd want a good, serious, you know, three to six months hard training before I got back in the ring again. I'd want to look a certain way. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'd probably go and get my hand back into Jiu-Jitsu and martial arts because, you know, it's blowing the cobwebs off. It's getting rid of the rust. And, you know, there's a few martial arts moves out there you could probably incorporate. I'm not on about kicks or spinning kicks or anything, but these throws and takedowns that you could incorporate into a match, you know, that, again, it's, it's bringing a couple of little signature moves in there. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'd want to put some uh, some graft in before I stepped into a ring again. Awesome. Cool, right. Thanks for your time, then, Chris. Hope you guys enjoyed listening to that. Thanks, mate. <laughs> I'll catch you soon. Right, guys. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, as always, it's always interesting to hear different people's uh, you know, points of view on things, their stories, their history, etc. Uh, a lot there with Chris. I didn't really know a great deal about Chris's previous history prior to him running the school there, so it was interesting to hear some of those things. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, as always, please share this. Let people know about it. Uh, It's Emmy Podcast everywhere. So twitter.com, facebook.com forward slash Emmy Podcast, emmypodcast.co.uk. We've got a few potential good names lined up for the next few podcasts. And again, the more people listen to this and share it, the more ability it gives me to get progressively bigger and more interesting names on it. So anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed that and we'll be back soon.